All right, so continuing on with the Communist Manifesto, I want to do section three and just break it up into those subsections. And so let me make sure I'm sharing my screen. So socialist and communist literature. All right, so this is where we'll see, um, we'll see uh, Robert Owen come into play uh, in this section or chapter of the manifesto. Okay, so uh, reactionary socialism. And under reactionary socialism, we have this other subsection, feudal socialism. Okay, so feudal socialism. <clears throat> Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern bourgeois society. In the French Revolution of July 1830, notice that he refers to July 1830 as the French Revolution, uh, so that's keep, keep that in mind. Uh, I went over that uh, briefly uh, er, in an earlier lecture. And in the English reform, reform agitation, these aristocracies again succumbed to the hateful upstart. Thenceforth, a serious political contest was altogether out of the question. A literary battle alone remained possible. But even in the domain of literature, the old cries of the Restoration period had become impossible. Okay, so uh, of course, there are those who are royalists who want a restoration either of the absolute monarchy in England or the ancien regime in in uh, France, okay, uh, but as Marx and Engels see it in 1848, uh, you know, that's, that ship has sailed, but in literature, uh, reactionaries, uh, so reactionaries are people who want to go backwards in history, royalists are reactionaries, uh, these reactionaries want to go back to some kind of, you know, neo-feudalism, uh, but it only operates within the imagination, within literature. In order to arouse sympathy, the aristocracy were obliged to lose sight, apparently, of their own interest and to formulate their indictment against the bourgeoisie in the interest of the exploited working class alone. Thus, the aristocracy took their revenge by singling uh, or by singing lampoons on their new master and whispering in his ears sinister prophecies of coming catastrophe. Okay, uh, notice that they're referring to the bourgeoisie as masters now and the aristocracy or the nobility as being uh, under the domination or enslaved to the bourgeoisie. Okay. In this way arose feudal socialism, half lamentation, half lampoon, uh, half, half sad crying for themselves, pity party, and half uh, joking, uh, making fun, uh, uh, half echo of the past, past, half menace of the future. At times, by its bitter, witty, and incisive criticism, striking the bourgeoisie to the very heart's core but always ludicrous in its effect through total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history. Okay. And so we hear, see here this, this idea of progress, that history is on a trajectory of progress, and reactionaries simply don't get it that we're moving forward. You can't go backwards. Okay. Now you may not agree with that, right? Not everyone agrees that history is progressing. You know, I for one would be one that, that you know is not so inclined to to that sort of uh, attitude. But that is, you know, what they think, and that's that's the optimism that's in communism. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, there's probably lag, but um, but uh, for one, if you look at uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, he, you know. He does a big number on this idea of progress in history. Okay, the aristocracy, in order to rally the people to them, waved the proletarian alms bag in front for a banner. But the people, so often as it joined them, saw on their hindquarters the old feudal coats of arms. 
and deserted with loud and irreverent laughter. Uh, so the aristocracy would try to mobilize the proletariat, but the proletariat would see through these thinly disguised reactionary ideas, trying to take the proletariat back to serfdom. One section of the French legit legitimists and young England exhibit this spectacle in pointing out that their mode of exploitation was different to that of the bourgeoisie. The feudalists forgot that they exploited under circumstances and conditions that were quite different and that are now antiquated. In showing that under their rule, the modern proletariat never existed, they forget that the modern bourgeoisie is the necessary offspring of their own form of society. Okay, so um, there's a kind of historical determinism here in Marx and Engels' view. Everything's progressing upward, and feudalism necessarily gave rise to the bourgeoisie. Uh, and, and, um, and, and the bourgeoisie necessarily gave rise to the proletariat and the old feudal, uh, you know, uh, forms of social structure are just not in place. You just can't go back. For the rest, so little do they conceal the reactionary character of their criticism that their chief accusation against the bourgeoisie amounts to this, that under the bourgeois regime, a class is being developed which is destined to cut up root and branch the old order of society. What they abrade the bourgeoisie with is not so much that it creates a proletariat as that it creates a revolutionary proletariat. Okay. In political practice, therefore, they join in all coercive measures against the working class and in ordinary life, despite their highfalutin phrases. They stoop to pick up the golden apples dropped from the tree of industry and to barter truth, love, and honor for traffic and wool, uh, beetroot, sugar, and potato spirits. Uh, and I wanted to uh, comment on uh, a revolutionary proletariat. Here we see the conception of the proletariat as the revolutionary class. This is going to come up in Dussel. He's going to he's going to redefine this, and um, and I'll try to do a lecture on that to to point that out to you. Uh, but this is um, this is you know a good topic that draws together the, the Communist Manifesto and draws together Dussel, and I don't think it's too complicated, you know, and we can all kind of kind of. Uh, kind of wrap our minds around it and, and get the, the idea of it. And it also ties into um, how we might organize to, to face the ecological cataclysm. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to do a lecture if I have time to, to bring that all together and make that a little clearer. And then you could write a response to that you know, in your final essay. Uh, but just with that sketch, you, know, you can do something at least. Okay. In political practice, therefore, they join in all coercive measures against the working class, the, the aristocracy do, the, the nobility and landed gentry, and in ordinary life, despite their high flute and phrases, they, oh, wait, I already read that. As the parson has ever gone hand in hand with the landlord, so has, the clerical, so has clerical socialism with feudal socialism. And so there is a a Christian sort of socialism that is really reactionary, uh, and they're calling this clerical socialism. Nothing is easier than to give Christian asceticism a socialist tinge. Has not Christianity declaimed against private property, against marriage, against the state? Yes, right? Monks give up their private property. They live in communes. Uh, they don't get married. Uh, and they stand apart from the state, you know, the Pope and Henry VIII fighting with each other. Uh, the, the, um, the Christians are on the side of, you know, the church against the state. Uh, has it not preached in the place of these charity and poverty, celibacy and mortification of the flesh, monastic life and mother church? Christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrat. Okay. All right, so I'll cut that off there and then I'll do the next section as a shorter video as well.